In the next One Piece, Zoro is lost in Perona's eyes. But also he doesn't know where he is. Please tell him where to go. (laughs) (laughs) The reason that Zoro has never gotten a crumb of coochie is because he can never find his way to it when it's offered to him. Talk about not knowing where the clitoris is. King of the what now's gonna take you down, gonna take you down. We're in for our yeah, it's getting hot now. It's getting hot now. King of the what now's gonna take you down, gonna take you down. Marine for our yeah, it's getting hot now. It's getting hot now. We've got a multi-act season, one, two, three. So come aboard to brave the sea. Supernovas and mystery. Warlords, wars, and tragedy. King of the what now's gonna take you down. Gonna take you down. Marine for our yeah, it's getting hot now. It's getting hot now. Celestial dragons, lowest of low. Overwhelming enemies, it's time to go. Boom. Luffy's gonna fight for his big bro, so now it's time to start the show. Boom. Hello, fellow adventurers from past adventures and familiar faces we haven't seen since yesteryear. Welcome to episode 106 of King of the What Now, a One Piece podcast reviewing the anime from the very beginning. As always, I'm your host, Joel, longtime fan of the series. And, you know, I'm just a former bad guy that was defeated by the hero like 200 episodes ago. And I just get a shout out in these episodes because I guess that's what we're doing. So, like, are you still a bad guy, though? Well, it's implied that I died. So, you know, it depends on whether you believe in, like, an afterlife or not. But I died in a blaze of pity and agony because I was fighting a boss who's going to show up like 800 episodes from now. Okay, okay, that's fair. My name is Kat, I'm the ghost of the show, and I'm just a little dude who's sitting on the prow of a ship thinking about my friends refusing to take a nap no matter how many times my Cool Ranch Dorito uncle tells me to. Please, you have to rest before the big battle. Don't wear yourself out. I'm not tired! (laughs) You're also recounting stories of your past because that's what we're doing. All right, before we get into the main episode, it's time for chatting with the hosts. You have been reading, and you've been telling me that you're pretty excited about the books you've been reading, so what's going on? Yes, so Leigh Bardugo is one of my favorite fantasy authors, and I read Six of Crows, the Six of Crows duology, and Ninth House by her a couple years ago. Whoa, 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 she's Ninth House too? Yeah. Oh, okay, but, but that's not, not the same Harry universe. The Wait, what? Ninth House and Harrow the Ninth okay. came out at the same time. But they're not the same <laughs> book. Okay, that's what got me confused. I didn't think that she was the space uh, necromancer story. Right, she okay. is not. Also, really quickly, for my edification, what's the sequel to Six of Crows called? I don't remember. Okay. Anyways. Anyways, so I she's one of my favorite fantasy authors, but I never read the original trilogy that kicked off her Grishaverse series. But now there's a Netflix show, so I'm going through that original series, and I'm liking it pretty good. I think she's grown a lot as an author, and you can really tell. Did I say this last week? I love so much how much we forget between episodes. Yes, last episode you said that you were reading the first book, and you explained how her universe is cool and based off of Russia, and, and how her first book isn't her strongest. But, so are you on the second book now? No, I'm on the third book now. Wow, you are ripping through those. Yes, I spend a lot of time running, and I like to listen to audiobooks when I run. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. It's weird being someone who was, like, a really avid reader as a child, but, like, not having time to read as an adult. So discovering audiobooks kind of let me recapture reading. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we are still making our way through Atlantris. Uh, we're we're going to do an entire bonus episode on it, so there's no need to like update our listeners about you know where we are in that. But even with a schedule that we're trying to stick to, it is hard to get through even one book. It's a pretty big book, but it's still just one book. So audiobooks are definitely the the way to go. Absolutely, I did have one more point about this trilogy that I'm reading. A character shows up in book two that I really, really like. And when I was looking at the Grishaverse books, there's a set of books that takes place in the future 
that he is the main character of. Why would but you I didn't spoil that for yourself. I didn't recognize his name uh, when I was looking into the Grisha verse books at the time. But now that I know who he is, I'm really excited to get to those books. So it's kind of like the whole Drist situation with R. A. Salvador is his name. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. So are you finished with the third one? Are you like right at the beginning, middle, halfway through? I I'm I just started it yesterday. Okay, so you're probably not super, super far. What of the three books so far, obviously you don't have a full picture of the third one, but uh, does it kind of suffer from that middle one's kind of the slow one? No, kind of? actually. They're all bangers so mm-hmm. far? Yeah, I actually think the first one is the weakest of them. Okay. Um, the second one introduces a lot more characters, and the way they play off of each other is really good. Okay. The main character, Alina, by herself, is a little bit... She suffers from, like, whiny baby no agency syndrome. Mm. And she's gotten better. Okay. And having other characters to play off of has also made it better. Sure. Well, and I'm sure that might also be intentional as a part of her growth. You know, uh, Harry Potter was a very specific way in the first couple of books. And, you know, a lot of people don't like early Steven Universe because of the way Steven acted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Cool. Anything else that you've been doing? No. That's pretty much it. You've been watching Invincible, right? Yeah, I've been watching the first half of Invincible. Kat and I have mentioned this many times, uh, fellow adventurers, that we don't really like uh, too much gore, and I really don't like spooky stuff. Kat's a little bit better at tolerating it. But I heard that the first episode had a pretty gruesome scene, so I decided to watch it on my own, and I almost didn't want to keep watching, but the world's interesting enough that I kept on going, but I think that if we were to watch me and Kat, I would have to try to keep an eye out for every, just every once in a while the, the, the very graphic scenes and kind of like cover her eyes or fast forward through it. But it's an interesting story if you haven't If you don't know anything about it, it's an animated story based off of a comic book where it's basically the son of Superman in this universe, and he gets his powers late in his teenhood. I guess that's technically a spoiler, because for about, like, two minutes in the first episode, they pretend, like, they don't know if he's going to get the powers. But in the comic books, there's just no question. It's just a matter of, like, when. And uh, there's just some really interesting stuff. There's the Guardians of the Globe, who are a very clear parody of uh, the the Justice League. There's the Red Streak, who goes really fast. And there's like a person whose costume is all green and they can shape shift through or they can phase through things and that kind of thing. The show has a lot of good humor. I don't know if it's the best show that I've ever seen, but it's worth a watch. If you know, you have uh, Amazon Prime, it's on there and... I like it. How would you say it's uh, holding up to, like, The Boys? <sighs> That's hard to say. The Boys was really good at character, kind of like drama and stuff. Like, there were tension, there were tense scenes where I was like, how are the characters going to get out of it? But in Invincible, it feels like some of the more serious moments can be played for laughs, and some of the characters feel, like, really two-dimensional. But I think the... Superman-ish character Omni-Man is interesting enough in what's going on with him because it seems like he maybe has not just his private life face and his superhero face, it seems like maybe he has a couple of different personalities depending on whether he's interacting with, like, the government or other superheroes or his family. And so that's just really interesting. Also, shout out to the clear... Hellboy slash Constantine character. Uh, I can't remember his first name, but his last name is Darkblood, and he's a demon who solves mysteries, a private investigator, and every case that he solves uh, shaves away time on his sentence uh, being in hell. And he's trying to run away and all that and all that kind of stuff. So it plays with a lot of familiar tropes. And you're like, oh yeah, that's that's just the Martians from from DC Comics. And oh, this guy basically has the same powers as like Gambit. And oh, this person has like an ancient curse. I've seen that in comic books, but it does them in kind of a new and interesting way. Very cool. Yeah. Anything else you've been doing? Yes, I have been playing Crash 4. It's about time. And uh, It's about time you play Crash 4. It's about time. Ah, uh, yeah. We're going meta. <laughs> it's, um, it's... Crash is a very specific type of game. If you do not like platformers and you do not like feeling like you have to get every jump exactly right, this game is not for you. But if you played Crash 1 through 3, 
it's the same game. It's really interesting. There's levels where you play as a different character and their moveset is different. There's special bonus levels where there's like no enemies. It's just a matter of jumping on the crates in the right order and, and getting them all. There's, you know, hidden gems like always. There's alternate costumes you get by playing through the levels multiple times and they, they, they're all bizarre and strange and unique. So I'm really liking it. It's, it's been absorbing a lot of my time lately. So can we expect like a Twitch stream anytime soon? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe. I don't think I'm very good at playing games and talking at the same time. But uh, if you like video games, there might be a bonus episode coming up that might interest you. Yeah, so we, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out how to best balance everything uh, in our lives because... If you've noticed, sometimes we upload the bonus episodes at the end of the month, which I tell myself is still a victory, because if it's up on May 30th, that's still the May bonus episode, it's still up, but I'd prefer to have them up on the first of each month and feel like I'm on top of things, and so I want to do really cool bonus episodes where people can say, wow, Joel and Kat really put in a lot of effort and they did some cool stuff, maybe they had some interesting guests or that sort of thing. But I also don't want to take on more than I can chew, especially with all of the 2020 ooey gooey still kind of floating around. Like, I haven't purged them all for my system, you know? And so, yeah, we're working on stuff, but we don't want to overpromise. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm just saying, like, if you're going to be working from home and playing video games, you might as well put them on Twitch. Oh, you? yeah, 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 absolutely. But I think that's just about everything. I've been drawing some more, trying to get back into it every day, and for all you creative types out there, always try to remember that if you just let your skills stagnate or you tell yourself oh, you'll do it tomorrow, maybe you'll end up in a place where you look back and you go, wow, I, I kind of spent my time differently than I wish I had. So I'm trying to keep my eyes on the prize. Someday I want to make a single dollar selling a commission at some kind of Comic Con event, and I won't get the skills to do that unless I keep practicing. I'm I'm gonna make you a solemn Cotwin promise right oh, now, Joel. Okay. We're done recording this episode. We're gonna go downstairs. We're gonna draw together because I have a painting I've been working on that I should get back to. Yeah, absolutely. I've also been playing Pokemon Go. It's not that important, but. Also, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe if I'm ever at a convention and people are like, oh my gosh, the Cotwin guys, we recognize them. I'm willing to make friends in Pogo and transfer Pokemon, not transfer, trade Pokemon. I'll trade, not legendaries, but I'll trade, you know, my, my fodder Pokemon for Bidoof's and Shinx's because I want a perfect Bidoof and I want another perfect Shinx on top of the perfect Shinx that I already have. On top of the two perfect Shinxes you already Do have. Do I have two? You have a perfect shiny Shinx, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I took a break for like a year and a half and now I'm trying to get back into it. It's helping me motivate myself for exercise, which is also super important. Uh, drink your water, sit up straight, eat your broccoli. You know, this has been your, uh, this has been your talk to from your Cotwin dad. But... I, it also means that there's a lot of new Pokemon where I'm like, oh, they added Swirlix to this game. Oh, they added Aromatease. So that's 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 pretty fun. So and that's been that's been chatting with the hosts. Yeah. So give me a succinct summary. No, I refuse. <laughs> Punch me in the balls with that sweet, sweet, succinct bullshit. Interesting. That's a, <laughs> I love the way that you phrase that. We just finished watching episodes 441 through 446. The succinct summary is really simple. We get a update for each of the crewmates that have been separated from Luffy. Let's tackle this in or order. Zoro is fighting some monkey with swords. Sanji is put in a dress. Usopp gets fat. Uh, Nami decides that she's going to learn weather wizard stuff. Chopper makes friends with a chunky bird baby. Uh, Robin joins the Revolutionary Army. Frankie gets punched so hard that his tea carbonates back into soda, and he becomes the regular Frankie that we know and love. Brooke decides that he's going to write a sonnet to help the people whose girl got kidnapped, and he discovers that they're in poverty. Then we get two episodes of flashbacks, one from Luffy's point of view that's kind of like his adventure so far, and another one where the narrator goes, hey, look at these Seven Warlords. Want to know more about the Seven Warlords? Well, here's the episode where Mihawk showed up in. He's got a sword. And also, you want to know about the three admirals? We're only going to tell you about two of the admirals because this other one is in shadow and we don't know who he is yet. And that's it. That's That's been your succinct summary. That was a great succinct summary. Thank that was you. the most succinct our summaries have ever been. Well, that's because these episodes are 
stupid. Yeah, I mean, I do like seeing the crew and how they are acting by themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Brooke being like, I have to pay back my panty debt is fantastic. Yes. Now, we've talked about this before, and I'm sure the hardcore One Piece fans are aware, but in the manga, Oda will sometimes draw... uh, the The cover page is not always something related to the story. It doesn't... Page one isn't, you know, Luffy fighting Anaru, for example, if that's where the last chapter uh, stopped. It's usually like a picture, and sometimes it's something silly, like Nami sitting in the rain uh, with a cat in a in a in a raincoat, and they're both just watching the rain or something. But sometimes they are side stories that are canon, but just aren't really important or aren't going to happen from Luffy's point of view, because that's typically where the story follows is is what Luffy's up to. So in the manga. Frankie and and Nami and all of them, their stories were told through these cover stories. I don't think there was a single chapter that just showed what is Sanji up to. And so these filler episodes are kind of expanding on it and they're giving like us a little bit more time of like what Zoro was up to, as opposed to showing like him wandering a candle with a candle, a castle with a question mark. And then the next cover story is like him and Perona like, ah! they like run into each other because they're both surprised and then the next one is him fighting a bunch of monkeys now you get like this kind of drawn out mystery of Zoro being like someone's following us who could it be and then he slashes and the, all the shadows are jumping around and then it turns out that they're they're monkeys with swords which is kind of a cool band name <laughs> one of them had an axe Yeah, they are monkeys that use weapons. And also, I might be spoiling things. I'm not sure if they actually showed us what the silhouettes were or if they just showed the shadowy silhouettes. But surprise, it's monkeys. Monkeys that can use human weapons that are very hard to fight. And it's so weird that Zoro, the guy who uses weapons, was sent to an island with a bunch of strong animals that fight with weapons. Yeah, and weird Nami does weather and she was sent to weather and... Mm, Yeah, absolutely. So I think I gave a pretty clear indication of what I thought about these episodes. You like the uh, catching up with the crew? Yeah, I do. I thought the Luffy flashback was bullshit and I thought the flash of the Marines was kind of bullshit because like it just showed us that there were people but it didn't do anything to move the story forward. Yes. So it absolutely was just... These guys are here. Special shout out to the the narrators kind of like zooming in on each character. And it's like, this is Moria. We first saw him when he fought Zoro at, it, uh, not Impel Down, uh, at, at Thriller Bark. And this is Moria and he can do shadow stuff. And then he gets a Dolph Lomingo Don Quixote and goes, he... He hasn't met Luffy. He he has no connection to the crew. And you're like, what the hell, guy? But we did get an extended flashback of... Bellamy and Zelfris, I think is his name. Who cares? The guy with the big sword. But we already got this flashback back when Luffy left Jaya or when he left Sky Island. We saw that Doffy was using whatever kind of ability he has seems to be puppet related. uh, But he made Zelfris kill Bellamy. And in this flashback, we get a slightly extended version where it looks like maybe Bellamy is going to survive. And I was like, oh, Bellamy? is still alive. And Bellamy goes, give me one more chance, please, I'll prove myself to you. And Davi goes, no. And then has Zelfris deliver a second fatal attack. So they they briefly gave me the hope that Bellamy was going to be alive again. I don't know why he would be. He doesn't seem like an important character. And then it seems to be that the filler episode was like, you know what? No, he is actually dead we double tapped just kidding doffy said this bitch in particular honestly without any kind of future knowledge as to like what happens with bellamy or doesn't happen because you know maybe he's dead i think it would be kind of cool if he joined the uh treasure seekers uh cricket and them like he atoned for you know attacking them and stealing their stuff by by being humble but that just doesn't seem like his character like bellamy seems like one of the just kind of like the scumbags who are not going to get redeemed. I, at the same time, he really seems to admire Doflamingo. Like he he gave off big, I would die for you vibes in this conversation. Very much the loyal dog, yeah. So I want to know, we know what Bellamy is like. What is Doflamingo like? Yeah, absolutely. That Bellamy wants to be that from where he is now. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and Doffy is talking about something like a new age coming, and we've gotten that talk once before with Blackbeard, who's a pretty important character. And uh, Blackbeard was talking about the era where pirates' dreams will never... Well, the pirate... The era where pirates' dreams will... That era will never end. And Doffy seems to be thinking that there's going to be a new era ruled by the strongest and the weak are just going to perish. And also the narrator said Doflamingo's abilities are unknown. So, yeah, I don't know. He seems like an interesting threat, but we don't really have much to go off of from these episodes. Do you want to talk about the new information that was secretly slid under the table during Sanji's episode? Yes, we discovered that Ivankov is the queen or king of uh, Kamabaka Island. Yes. So the place that Sanji was sent to with all of the various people who are either cross-dressers or trans, unclear, probably a mixture of Could we just say the people who have girlish hearts? You know what? Yeah, absolutely. I just, I don't want to make it sound like it's confirmed that all of these characters are exclusively trans or they're all exclusively just men who like wearing dresses. It's unclear what their specific life stories are. The people of Peachy Island, of Kamabaka Kingdom, they worship Ivan. It's, they they really respected Ivan and they're like, Ivan is our true king or queen. I don't remember which they used. And... I, we meet like Coruscant, I think, or something like that, and she is the substitute queen acting in place of Ivan, who has not returned to the island. So that's really interesting. Also, I love that we didn't get confirmation that Ivankov was connected to the islands until after we've already met him. Yeah, well, and even the name of the prison land makes sense now. Right. New Kamavaka. Ivankov recreated his kingdom within the jail. Absolutely. So beyond that... I only really have one other one other question, and then we're gonna kind of we're gonna do something different with this episode of the podcast. But in your opinion, do you think the two retrospective episodes, Luffy's point of view, and then the one talking about the seven warlords and the three admirals, do you think those were added simply for padding, like the six or the three episodes before or the four episodes before with with the other crewmates, or do you think that Marine Ford is really going to be so big that they wanted to like? put it up on a pedestal by having this, like, in case you miss it, here are the 400 episodes that have all been leading to this. I'm not sure about the villains, the the Marines kind of flashback, because that one might have actually been an actual reminder. But the Luffy stuff really did feel like padding. I don't even remember that episode. Like, I blanked <laughs> it from my mind as soon as I watched it. Yeah, it was basically just all the times that Luffy has met with either Ace or Blackbeard leading up to this. So, I don't know. Again, without going into future knowledge too much, this is kind of a pivotal moment in the One Piece world. Not just Luffy's journey, but, like, the world. And so, I do think that they're trying to get make it a little bit more grandiose, but I do wish that there had been... I wish that they had coordinated with Oda and they had ushered in this war by showing us a bunch of other characters, like... This is the only fisherman to serve in the Navy, and he he defeated seven famous pirate captains. And this is a vice admiral who has been serving under Garp for 30 years. Like, I think that would be a lot more interesting than just flashbacks and stuff that we've already seen. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Or even, like, characters that the Straw Hats have affected, seeing, like, how they're preparing for the effect this war is going to have Mm -hmm. on the world. Because a lot of people are probably going to ground, and then a lot of people are probably preparing to take advantage of whatever chaos ensues as mm. a result. That's very interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, I would love that. We got that when Luffy got his first bounty, and when they went up Reverse Mountain, we got kind of, I think it's called uh, From the Decks of the Seas or something, is another cover story that Oda does. So yeah, I would have loved a format a little bit more like that. Now, we don't have a whole lot to talk about in these episodes because, like, literally, even the stuff with the other crew members was padding. Like, we already knew that uh, Frankie landed in the area where Vegapunk is. So, like, him going into Vegapunk's lab is kind of like, yeah, we assumed. Or Nami being like, I'd like to learn weather. Yeah, we assumed. So, there's not much to talk about. We don't want this to be a, a short episode. I do have a quick question for you. Oh, okay. Brooke. Not wanting to see man panties. Is that joke funny 
Or did you get tired of it pretty quickly? Because I, I kind of went back and forth on whether I thought that was funny or not. I, the whole gag is, the whole can I see your panties gag is just dumb. And I don't I don't get what the humor is supposed to be. Like, I, is the idea that he spent 50 years out at sea so he doesn't have any manners anymore? I think so, yeah. But I don't really like the joke. I do kind of find it funny that Brooke finally found people who were willing to give him what he wanted, but through their own ignorance or whatever, they give him the wrong thing. So it's kind of like karmic, you know? But uh, I don't know if that's what Oda was going for, if Oda was just like, haha, men underpants or whatever. <laughs> but you did point out that in his episode, after a... So, okay, this country, I think it's called Hungary, hung, Hungary, uh, it has been... Uh, ravaged by a tribe of long arms, which I guess is a people. Makes sense. Giants are their own people. Fish people, like merfolk, are their own people. Uh, but these, the long arms have kind of like destroyed this lesser country and just take whatever they want. So they don't have any food. And Brooke accidentally, for he realized that they don't have a lot of food, he eats like a week supply of their food, but then he realizes that they're so hungry, and they tell this story of like, you know, all of their capable men or, uh, you know, women are being taken, and Brooke's like, I have to repay my debt, even if it's just man panties, pantsuits, uh, I have to, I have to repay my debt, so... That's, that's pretty touching. I'm glad that Brooke is not the type of person to just, like, leave a group of people in distress. Well, and I think the thing, too, that makes the panties joke a little bit closer to funny for me is that Brooke takes no for an answer. Like, he's always very polite. He asks, and they say no, and then he's like, okay, cool, we're moving on. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess that's true. So, and he's just like... It's it's such a trope, like the dirty old man. Yeah. And like you said, he's been at sea for 50 years, so he doesn't have any manners left. So that all kind of like makes it funnier to me than if Sanji were wandering around asking to see panties, for example. Yeah, Brooke doesn't really, in my mind, come across as misogynistic. And I know that there's different people who have different thresholds and different definitions and that sort of thing. But like you said, he basically just seems to kind of like ask awkward questions and then he kind of just drops it and whereas Sanji seems a little bit more like sometimes in the way that he's he's portrayed yeah absolutely that just the way you said the thing about the awkward questions reminded me of Luffy's do you poop oh yes I poop <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness gracious so what I wanted to do with this episode is I wanted to kind of do our own sort of retrospective, not of our own podcast. We're not that arrogant, you know. Here's the top 100 times that we made ourselves laugh on our on our episode. But we could look at the story so far of One Piece. We are getting close to what's considered the halfway point in the story, and so now might be a good time to to take a breather and just kind of focus on the crew. I was thinking we could go through the Straw Hats in basically order of introduction, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we can just kind of talk about their dreams and like, where do we think their story is going to take them by the end of the story? Okay. As always, we will include the disclaimer that we are trying not to let future knowledge uh, cloud our judgment or we're not going to be like, I predict that in chapter 681, Zoro will use the 72 pound phoenix to hit the left eye of the demon as I have the ma manga app open in front of me. But we're just talking general ideas. Luffy wants to be king of the pirates. And as we recently learned, as he was talking to Rayleigh, he considers the king of the pirates to be the freest man of the sea. We also know that he wants to go to Raftal, where there is the legendary treasure One Piece, but some people don't think it exists. Regardless of what you've or heard Oda say in interviews, what do you think of the idea that the One Piece doesn't exist? If, if the One Piece didn't exist, I would feel a little ripped off. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, I know a big part of One Piece is it's the adventure that Luffy cares about, right? If somebody showed him proof that the One Piece existed, he wouldn't want to go after it anymore because he wants an exciting adventure. But I also feel like he wants there to be something at the end of that exciting adventure. Yeah, well, and like, 
what Luffy wants doesn't necessarily map to what everyone else wants. I could see Oda writing a story where Luffy ends up on Raftal or wherever the One Piece is supposed to be, and there's nothing there, and Luffy laughs his ass off because, like, oh, Roger tricked us, even though Roger wasn't the one who insinuated the One Piece was there. It's kind of strange. But anyways... I could see Luffy laughing, and I could see Oda writing the other crew members also laughing because, like, Luffy's laughter is infectious. But I think in my hands, if Luffy showed up and there was nothing there, I would have Usopp and Nami react with, like, shock and anger. Like, we went through all of that for nothing? Like, we love Luffy. For a rock with haha, get wrecked, scrub. Signed, Gold Roger. <laughs> 420 YOLO, gonna be the Pirate King! Uh, yeah, so, you know, it would feel incredibly cheap if there was nothing there, and, you know, for us, the readers, you can see that Luffy is changing the world wherever he goes. He saved Alabasta from destruction. He was able to recover uh, Drum Kingdom from Wapple when he returned, and that sort of thing. But it wouldn't make sense for Luffy's journey to just kind of lead to nothing. And it also seems like the world government so far has been doing a lot of stuff. You know, they blew up Ohara because Ohara got too close to the truth. They claimed that Smoker was the one who defeated Crocodile. Uh, they haven't advertised that Moria was defeated. I mean... That'd be kind of weird if they did, but, you know, there's just, they do a lot of stuff that has to do with information suppression, so I almost wonder if the skepticism is partially because, yeah, like there's an island in the sky, like if someone told me that, I, would, I wouldn't believe them, but I think it also might be a targeted disinformation campaign from the government, because again, we know the government was formed 800 years ago in opposition to some group, we don't know anything about that group, but... Maybe the One Piece has something to do with it. Maybe that's, if the people of a certain time were destroyed, you might still have the myths and the legends. There might have been people who visited this lost country, heard some stories, left, the country gets bombed, but that visitor is still out and about telling their grandkids about like, oh yeah, this one time I went to a city and the buildings were made out of rainbows and like, funny story, Grandpa, ha ha. But then the collective zeitgeist of the people is that is there a rainbow city somewhere out there and so i think that the one piece is going to be incredibly important to the world even if maybe it's not exactly what luffy set out to find absolutely so have you had a favorite luffy moment kind of looking back oh oh there's so many uh anytime luffy get serious is a good moment. I like that he is pretty goofy consistently, even in a lot of uh, life and death situations. But, you know, for example, when he tells Soga King, burn down that flag. That was exactly the standout moment I was going to call out. Yeah. And well, I mean, the other one that I love, I've said this before again and again and again, Luffy covering himself in his own blood to defeat Crocodile. And Crocodile says, do you have any idea who I am? Do you know who I am? One of my father's favorite things to say. Luffy says, I don't give a shit who you are. I will surpass you. That single line is everything Luffy stands for in his journey. And I love it. I, I, I remember it so, so vividly every time. Absolutely. A uh, shout out to Luffy smiling on the execution platform. At yes. Longtown. Right before he was executed. It's strange because in that episode, he seemed really at peace with, you know, oh, maybe this is where I die. But we've also seen like him fight much harder enemies and basically be like, you're not strong enough to kill me. So it's weird that he accepted his hand, his death at the hands of Buggy. Maybe Buggy will be the one to kill Luffy, and Luffy can inherently sense that. He knows that Buggy is from the E line instead of the D line of lineage. Bug E clown. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Do you have anything else? Do you have a favorite laughing moment from Luffy? A moment when he's at his goofiest? It's hard to pick just one, honestly. Him standing naked in the cell in Amazon Lily <laughs> is pretty amusing. Or him yelling at them for putting flowers on his You clothes. know what never fails to get a smile out of you, but I think maybe isn't at the forefront of your mind? The, uh, the islands in the south are cold and they're all idiots! <laughs> like, that always gets you every single time. Every time. No, absolutely it does. 
All right. Our second crew member is Zorro. Yeah, absolutely. Zorro's plan is pretty simple. He wants to become the strongest swordsman in the world, and right now that means defeating Mihawk. But do you think that there's anything more to his journey? Do you think there might be something that Mihawk failed to do that Zoro will have to do to prove that he's better? Do you think maybe someone will take out Mihawk and then Zoro will be like, shit, now what do I do? Well, and like I've said it before and I'll say it again, I feel like strongest swordsman in the world is a really hard to define goal because like what do you have to go out and fight every single person who's ever picked up a sword like how do you prove that how do we know mihawk is the strongest maybe there's someone on the opposite side of the globe who's just chilling but could beat him yeah some some kaiju monster that sleeps underneath the ocean that only wakes up every two thousand years but has a sword in its mouth this tiny little toothpick of a sword compared to its giant body yeah i don't I don't know, so I imagine that there's going to be a big climactic battle, and Zoro's going to have to prove himself at that moment. I don't think that Zoro is just going to challenge Mihawk. They're going to enter the tournament together. They're going to be wearing the same gi, and they're going to fight, and everyone else is just going to be watching. That doesn't feel like the way One Piece operates, so I imagine the fight for the One Piece will involve someone else on Raftal. It could be the Marines. They don't seem to like pirates very much. It could be Blackbeard. He seems to be nefarious. It could be one of the four emperors of the sea. But someone will be there, and it will basically be a race to the top of the mountain. Whoever gets the One Piece first wins. And, you know, you and I think that it might be a weapon. So maybe that's how you prove that you win. You shoot the other team with the ultimate weapon. But I think that Luffy's going to be racing, and some very strong, notable swordsman, maybe Mihawk, will be like, you cannot pass until you defeat me. And Zoro will be like, I have to win to support my captain. And it's going to be like this televised thing where like the world knows that like <gasps> the, the the country of Ongaria will be destroyed if 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 uh, this team if the if Blackbeard wins and they will see Zoro win they'll be like oh my god or he'll do some impossible feat he'll he'll slay the golden dragon they'll be like oh my god no one's oh. ever done that before <laughs> I like that a lot so what are your notable Zoro moments Oof I mean his first impression that he really left on me was when he fought Mihawk you know as a, a scars on on a swordsman back are a swordsman shame uh but I mean I guess that or the, like okay one of my favorite Zoro moments when he decided he was going to cut off his legs when he was getting trapped in Mr. Three's wax. And then uh, he's like, oh, thank God I can stop cutting through my leg now because Luffy showed up. I also like the, uh, you guys should have posed when you had the chance (laughs) from that same fight. One of my favorite Zoro moments is still, even all the way caught up where we are, um... In both power and range, my weapon vastly outclasses yours. Talking yes. to a guy with a cannon. Yeah. <laughs> Z- Zoro has silly moments, but they seem to get rarer and rarer. And I almost wonder if, like, he feels he has to be the responsible one to compensate for Luffy's dumbassery. But yeah, in the beginning, he had a lot more character, and a lot of other people have kind of noticed, like, a decline in that. But he does get some badass moments, even if he doesn't have as many goofy, dumb teenage moments. Absolutely. For sure. Really quickly, what do you think of Ashura? Like, what is that? Is that going to be something he has to, like, conquer? Is it going to be, like, him giving into the dark side? So, I have I have mixed feelings about Ashura. Uh, without going too far into how hockey works, because we don't want to use foreknowledge and spoilers and whatever, I have always assumed... Ashura was some form of hockey, like reverse observation hockey, where he's projecting this like terrifying aura okay. onto people. But Oda has said it's not hockey, so I don't know what it is. Yeah, we got the hint that there are three cursed blades in the Katetsu line, I believe it's called. And he currently has the Sandai Katetsu, which is the third and weakest sword that, is, that was Forge. Uh, he got that back in Logetown. We basically never hear about Cursed Blades again 
skin. There are some people who speculate certain characters who we may or may not have met already might have a cursed blade because it sounds like it's not just like these three swords. There might be 20 cursed blades and that sort of thing. But the the weapon grade thing, Oda mentioned it and then he never brought it up again. And it's kind of like how we never see Nami specifically doing cartography. Uh, I think Oda's trying to focus on the on the main story rather than all these branching details. But I just, I don't know, man. I assume that that's, he, I think Zoro's ultimate opponent, whether it's Mihawk fighting at full power or it's someone who who defeated Mihawk in, you know, underhanded tactics, I think they're going to be the first person that Zoro fights who can do their own version of Ashura, and they're going to have to do like a demon battle. That's 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 what I assume. That would be awesome. Yeah. You know what would be cool? If the the evolution of Ashura was like some kind of monster that Zoro creates with his blades. <laughs> like I'm thinking of the the uh rock off in Scott Pilgrim. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're also thinking of uh, stand powers, I believe, is uh, what they're commonly known as. Yeah, or uh, what was it? The one that I liked, God of High School. Yes, yeah, yeah. The cherry uke, I think it was called. I, I, I wasn't as good at remembering the terms from that. It was like, it was spelled chakriok, but it wasn't said that way. And I don't speak Korean, so I apologize for butchering it. <laughs> I think that about wraps it up for Zoro. Now, technically, Nami showed up in, like, the very first episode, and she helped them by the time they got to uh, Usopp's village. Uh, she was there when they fought Buggy the Clown, but Usopp was the next person to officially join, according to the Kotlin canon. Uh, Usopp wants to be a brave man of the sea. We are 446 episodes into this series. Do you have any better idea of what that means? I think it means that he will stand up for his ideals and won't run from a fight. Okay. So I think he actually has made the most progress if you consider his his interaction with Luffy at Water 7. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. But I guess... I assume that everyone, all of the characters are going to have like a final climactic moment at the end of the series where they do something that that proves that they've reached their goal. Luffy will get the One Piece, emerge from the rubble, undefeated King of the Pirates. Zoro will fight Mihawk and defeat him. Mihawk will say, you've bested me on this day. But I just don't know what San- what San- what Usopp's going to do in order to prove that he's a brave warrior of the sea. I'm wondering if he's going to end up on Elbath at some point, like maybe with the rest of the crew, maybe by himself even, and he's going to end up being king of the giants. Oh my gosh, that would be so good. that will be him achieving his dream. But you're right, he is the only one, well, him and Chopper have like these very broad, how do you plan to attain that kind of dream? Well. Yeah, and maybe the idea is that Usopp will prove that he's brave if he makes it all the way to the end of the Grand Line and back. If he if he comes back to East Blue after having traveled through both halves of the Grand Line, if he if he manages to do that without running from any of his battles, then yeah, I guess that that counts. Can we agree that Usopp Water Seven is some of the best character writing in the series? Yes, that is. Water 7 is just some of the best character writing in all of the series. I love Robin and Frankie's interactions on the sea train and and Robin's I Want to Live, but Usopp is really the MVP of Water 7 specifically before we get more from from Robin and Frankie. And yeah, that's that's a brilliant fight. It's cool. It's it's hell yeah because you know Usopp's using all of the tricks that he's seen, but it's also emotionally resonant and there is a time where I just didn't know if Usopp was going to leave the crew. I could see it being believable that Usopp would kind of, you know, uh, uh, duck out, cower out, maybe form his own pirate crew and come back later, but I just wasn't sure. So what a what a tense scene that was. Absolutely. Can we pull lines from the movies? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this isn't technically an Usopp moment. This is somebody else talking about Usopp, but... Luffy was talking about Usopp, and he said, if I get rid of my weak friends, who will I have parties with? 
<laughs> and that like sums up Usopp so perfectly. He's he's the good times friend. Yeah, he's the best friend and that sort of thing. This doesn't seem like the sort of show where like Luffy will break and turn to the dark side and get possessed by evil. But if he did, I could see Usopp being the one who pulls him out of it. And that's just awesome. Also... His sniping isn't related to his goal of being a brave warrior, but if the final battle happens on Raftal, as I think is going to happen, and everyone has a moment, Zoro cuts through something that no one else could cut through, Usopp is obviously going to snipe someone from like 800 miles away, and he's going to prove that he's like the best sniper. Do you think anything's going to happen with his dad? Like, is he going to meet his dad, and they're going to fight? They're just going to see each other and be like, yo, you exist. Usopp will go to snipe something, and then his weapon will get shot out of his hand. And he'll be like, blah, and he'll look. And, like, several miles away on the mast of a pirate ship will be this guy. Okay. But I don't think they're ever actually going to, like, have a face-to-face, heart-to-heart. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think that in a perfect world, I could see them interacting with each other. But Usopp has literally never mentioned Yasop again after he left his island i he did technically mention it with uh daddy the father in that filler episode that oda actually wanted to include in the manga but he cut for time but i just i don't see it informing usopp's character a lot but not a lot of the straw hats really talk about their past except for ex- in extreme moments and so maybe it will settle maybe it won't so we j- will just have to see absolutely on to sanji Yes, Sanji the chef. Sanji wants to discover the All Blue, which is the most fantastical of the different uh, dreams that the different One Piece people have. Is the One Piece hidden in the All Blue? No. Okay. We've we've talked about this before, so I won't go too into detail, but we think that the One Piece is a weapon that will destroy the Red Line, which would thus create the All Blue. Okay. So I think by fulfilling Luffy's dream, Sanji will fulfill his own. Okay, Sanji's goal isn't to discover the All Blue, but to create it with his own two kicking feet. Well, and it's interesting, too. We haven't gotten a Nami yet, but like... Sanji's goal is to find the all blue and Nami's goal is to map the world. And how simpatico. These these are all goals that they will achieve by following Luffy. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So if if it's Luffy's destiny to destroy the red line or whatever and mix all of the oceans back together, then that will create the opportunity for Sanji's dream. I really like that. Assuming that there's a big giant battle on Raftal and every crew member gets their own chapter, their own set of chapters to shine, is Sanji going to kick something really hard? Is he going to kick the golden dragon in order to knock it towards Zoro so Zoro can cut it? Or what, what do you see his crowning moment being? Yeah, it'll probably be kicking some stuff. I wish that it incorporated the chef stuff more, but I can't see how it would. Hmm. There's a rampaging monster... That can't be stopped, and Sanji cooks the perfect dish that tames it, and now they have a beast friend on their side. Amazing. Actually, if I had... I think I would love for his crowning moment to be something related to food. I think his crowning moment being he kicks a guy really hard would be a little lame because there's other aspects to his character, but I could also see... A beautiful woman who's, like, super important. Uh, She's, like, the princess of the world or something. Or, like, she's the last princess of the D-line, you know, that that Luffy's from. Some kind of important woman who's obviously going to be gorgeous and stacked. And her waist is going to be about as round as a quarter. And Sanji will protect her because she's not a fighter. she's she's, She's a diplomat. And so Sanji's goal will be to protect the princess, save her from getting kidnapped, and that will be his crowning moment. Okay. That could also, if she gets kidnapped and he has to save her, go back into the Mr. Prince stuff where he's the one who's being sneaky and and going around stuff. Yes, more of that, please. Alabasta Sanji was peak Sanji. I... Mr. Prince is just such a good Sanji moment. I really like the way that he helped during the Thriller Bark fight against Oz, where he wrapped that chain around Oz, and then he kicked the lever over in order to, like, straighten his back or whatever. It wasn't him delivering a powerful kick, but it was him doing some pretty cool and suave stuff. Do you have another standout Sanji moment? 
a, a lot of people take issue with this scene, but I really like him holding Nami and like being careful about how he fought on Thriller Bark. Yeah, I, I could see why that would upset some people, but that's just such a cool moment. I really like for a comedic moment, the moment where he is skipping towards uh, Nami in her wedding dress. And he's like, oh, it's Nami Swan, Nami Swan. And then he just kicks uh, uh, Absalom or the zombie priest out of the way and catches her. Like, that's just such a good, good moment. Yeah, I think that Sanji has a lot of good comedic moments, actually, of the three strongest members of the crew. Absolutely. I agree. And like, can we just agree, best dressed Zoro and Luffy don't care about the way that they're dressed. Frankie's just always in his underpants. Usopp dresses for utility, not for style. But Sanji, he's got it. Sanji's looking good. Absolutely. He and Robin are the ones that dress them in the movies. <laughs> I think Brooke helps too. I think Brooke has a pretty good sense of fashion because he he believes in the fashion that's never outdated. So even though it's been 50 years, it still fits. Which brings us to Nami. Nami's goal is to chart the entire uh, ocean. That's an interesting goal, and it mostly just entails being on the ship for a little while, which makes me wonder, is there going to be a place that's impossible to chart? I'm not sure what her, if she's going to have a single moment that you can point to and say she's achieved her dreams. I'm not sure. She feels like she might be in the afterward or the epilogue where she's like and this is the day that i finally finished my map 20 years after the events you know now that i think about it actually the whole thing about one piece is adventure right and adventure you never want it to die so maybe the reason that a lot of them have these kind of vague goals uh that you could argue could never definitively be achieved maybe it's because their adventure is never going to end for so sure. Usopp's adventure to be a strong warrior of the sea, that doesn't necessarily have an end. And like Nami theoretically could map every detail of the entire world, but that's like 80 years in the making. Okay, yeah, 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 I see that. At the same time, we do like stories to have definitive ends. I don't think Oda's going to continue writing this until he's just a robot brain in a jar in the year 2399. But, you know, and also... Uh, Rayleigh mentioned that he is not as strong as he used to be now that he's getting older. And so Usopp can be a brave warrior, but I think there's a physical peak that he's going to reach and he has to kind of like be a brave warrior of the sea at some point. But I could I could see the argument being that he's already brave. Look at all of the different monsters that he's fought and all the different obstacles that he's overcome. Excuse me. Yeah, absolutely. So because I've been kind of mind cannoning this final scene in my head for, you know, Luffy has to fight off Blackbeard. I'm assuming Blackbeard's the final villain. He has to fight off Blackbeard in order to get to uh, the One Piece on Raftal before anyone else. Uh, Zoro has to cut something. I just keep using the Golden Dragon example. Sanji has to protect it. It'll a... be a Diamond Dragon. <laughs> Which would go back to, what are you going to cut next, Diamonds? Perfect. I love your big sexy brain. Sanji is going to be protecting a or saving a beautiful woman who has some political importance or has the key to the door that the One Piece is locked behind or whatever. Uh, Usopp is going to be sniping people from just, you know, hundreds of yards away. He's also probably going to be the one who rallies a bunch of like the rabble from all the other. He's going to he's going to get Lola. He's going to get Iceberg. He's going to get Kaya. They're all going to join Nami together. I can see Nami taking that role too. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But Nami is going to have two roles that I well, is it two roles or is it one role? First off, it's going to be very hard to navigate to the final island, to Raftal. And so what she is going to do is she's going to have to navigate through these turbulent winds and she's going to be able to make it through with her single ship. And Blackbeard's going to have an armada of like 7,000 ships, but he'll lose half of them before the battle even starts because he doesn't know how to, to navigate the, the waters and they'll all be destroyed. He's missing his... Baby doll. Baby doll. But I also think that the navigation might be tricky due to the weather, and I think that Nami's going to be able to use it to her advantage somehow. Also, Blackbeard's going to have something else that's not an attractive woman, but something else that uh, is is 
messing with them in some way. He has like a button, and if he presses the button, Luffy will just explode, just somehow. And you're like, oh no, that's really bad. Nami will have to thieve it back, and so that that will also harken back to her her early um, appearance in the manga and that sort of thing. So that's what I see happening for the East Blue Five. Is that what people call them? Just the East Blue Crew, I think? Yeah, the East Blue Crew. That's awesome. I like that a lot. And we will do another one of these episodes about the other crew members, I think. Yeah. Next time we have one of these kind of flashbacky episodes. But we don't want to go for too long. And I think the East Blue is a good place to stop. Do you have any kind of final thoughts you want to take us out on? Hmm. I think something that we will have to figure out is what does the D initial mean And why are Luffy and Marshall D. Teach so polar opposites in some ways, but so similar in other ways? I think there's a history here, and I mean, it's it's clear there's a history here, but I think in order to figure out what Blackbeard's endgame is, we would have to know those details, which we don't know yet. But I am positive that Blackbeard is the final threat, because we have already seen Luffy uh, affecting kind-hearted Marines. You've got Kobe, you've got Garp, and you've also got uh, a Smoker, who has kind of like started to see the light that is Luffy, even though he still doesn't like pirates. And, you know, arguably, Aokiji uh, didn't kill Luffy because he was like, I owed your grandfather, uh, you know, something good. So the Marines exist to fight pirates, which are mostly bad. Yusa's kid crucified people, for God's sake. Uh, So I see the Marines as an antagonist, but I think they are redeemable because they just want peace ultimately and if they if they spend enough time with luffy they might see that luffy's doing more good than harm which is why blackbeard strikes me as the ultimate bad guy because he will kill a crewmate he will say oh i kind of feel bad about it but he won't think twice about doing it he will plunge the world and forgive the pun i guess if that's what it is but he will plunge it into darkness he wants to destroy things as opposed to the marines who just want strict order and take things way too far far sometimes and so blackbeard is the final villain and we're going to see how he's building his own strength because he's on a parallel journey with luffy if if this is about the halfway point and if luffy's unlocked gear second and gear third he's figured out how to use the devil fruit more uh methodically blackbeard is probably also doing the same thing behind the scenes and i think that has been your do 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 final thought outro goes here thanks for listening everyone next episode of the podcast we'll be covering episodes 459 through 465 and hey hit us up on twitter or email if you have any thoughts about like how the end of the series is going to go when we cover those episodes probably at the end of the marine ford saga i would love to talk about other people's opinions is sanji gonna do a kick or is he gonna make a giant meat platter who knows thanks for listening have a great day Ha ha! What a great episode of King of the What Now, your One Piece podcast that started from the very beginning and stars these two doofuses. If you want to follow us on social media, Twitter is the best place to do that. I am at K-O-T-W-N underscore pod. And I am at Pirate Ghost Host. Absolutely, yes. We share all sorts of thoughts on there, some related to the podcast, some related to other things. But you can also reach us through email at kingofthewhatpod at gmail.com, or you can also find us on Patreon. We would love some subscribers or supporters, whatever the technical term is. Patrons. Patrons. So fancy and grown up. Uh, And you can find that at patreon.com slash king of the what pod you can find all sorts of things like bonus episodes and you get to see the full cold open candidates not just the ones that make it into the episode maybe someday if i learn to draw i'll put stuff up there we're always looking for suggestions and feedback and speaking of which please take a moment to rate and review our podcast wherever you get us from so itunes spotify scrivener that's for writing but wherever you listen to our podcast take 
take a moment to leave a review. It helps other people find us. We are so grateful to all of our listeners, and we couldn't do this without you. Absolutely. Word of mouth is super powerful, so if you have a friend who likes One Piece and they haven't heard of us, just direct them to the latest episode. And if they hate us, they can tell us why. And if there's an actionable item, we'll try to please you. That's how this works. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.